Okay, so I want to just try to practice some of the things that we've talked about so that we can try to get an understanding. So, let's start here. <clears throat> Um, the arrangement between me and the defendant was basically a verbal agreement with a bill of sale, uh, actually not a bill of sale, a receipt, stating that we were going to purchase 17 guitars that were used and in decent condition from this shop, Lenny's Music, and they were going to be for the amount of $7,500. And the reason I'm here, the reason I feel... I've been disgruntled is the the items that we purchased were not up to snuff. They were not what Lenny promised them to be. Nine of them were not working. Nine of them were distorting when they were turned up to volume five or more. And therefore, uh, I believe I'm due a refund. Uh, what I would like to get across to the judge is this gentleman is basically a shady character and should not be in business because when you promise something, you should come through. I mean, I'm in business, I know what it's like to make promises, and I, I feel like I'm an um, ethical person where if I say I'm gonna come through with something, you bet your bottom dollar that you're gonna get what I promised. And I'm sorry, but Lenny's music did not come through. Oh, this guy came into my uh, shop and uh, asked me for uh, 17 you decent guitars that he was going to use for some outdoor festival, um, and he needed by a certain date, and we agreed on $7,500 as the uh, sale price, and I fulfilled my end of the obligation. Well, my position is very clear. In fact, I got it in writing. Truth is that I got a sign up in my shop very clear that says, uh, no refunds on used merchandise. That's it. I fulfilled my obligation. I got him the guitars. Uh, I got him on time. I got him uh, winning the price range that we talked about. And, uh, and he tried them out in my shop. Bang, bang, boom. It's done. <laughs> okay, so now of these two, which, which one would you all want to represent? The first one. Okay, raise your hand if you want to represent. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't, look, I should have done my soft tissues because that's what I needed for, because see, and so who, who's going to represent me? Okay, see, I'll sometimes, okay, all right, well let me just say this, sometimes you're not going to like the person that you have to represent, I'm just letting y'all know that, I mean, Lenny comes in and he wants to retain the firm, what you going to say? You're going to be like, come on in, Lenny. That's what I need you all to be ready to say at least. So, turns out, you might have to represent me. <laughs> so, I'm going to hand each one of you. Who we represent? Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you raised your hand for, me. <laughs> for the other lady. <laughs>
Hex Band Records LLC is a record label in Los Angeles, California that has 17 up and coming artists. It promotes the artists by having concerts. Hex Band has an upcoming promotional outdoor concert when its artists will perform using used guitars that the artists will autograph and Head Spin will give away to members of the audience. Head Spin is interested in purchasing these 17 used guitars from Lenny's store. And so here I have information about the parties <clears throat> and then the deal. The deal is going to be for a bulk sale of 17 used guitars. Lenny states that the guitars are of decent, playable quality. Ding, dang, boom. You could really say ding, dang, boom, didn't you? <laughs> Ding, dang, boom. The purchase price is going to be $7,500. There is no warranty, express or implied, no, return, no returns, and no refunds. Uh, and the closing date is going to be July 21st, 2018. There is some other information about the players, some information about the client goals. Then he is so frantic about his profit margin and losing and losing money that he keeps having a recurring nightmare that has been sued him over the deal and he had to go to court. Lenny wants us to draft an agreement such that this nightmare will not come true and so that Lenny does not suffer any loss or liability. I've given you your format here and these are the applicable sections that we're going to use for this agreement, okay? All right. So now, we're going to get some more information. Ms. Sears, why don't you go ahead and tell me a little bit about why you're here today. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I am part of a company, it's a record label called Headspin Records. Uh, we have 17 clients under our roof, and they're artists that are up and coming. And one of the ways that we, we get their music out there is by having concerts, outdoor concerts. And this year, what we've done is we've had 17 of our artists come out and perform with used guitars. So the lead guitarist of that band would be playing that used guitar. And then after the concert is over, the entire band would autograph that guitar and it would be given away to one of the members of the audience. Unfortunately, out of the 17 guitars that we purchased from this gentleman, nine of them were not functioning. Um, when we went to find them and, and purchase them, he claimed that they were in decent shape. Now, did you purchase them personally? Well, I have a production coordinator who did that for me, and his name is Phil Spencer, and he went out there and spoke to uh, Lenny, and he said that he needed these guitars, Lenny said he could get them for him, and so after about two months, we finally got a phone call, which was actually three days before the event, and said that, that he finally got all the guitars, and my production coordinator went over there and tested them out, and then they were couriered to our office before the concerts. Okay. So um. I did not actually physically speak to them. This is the first time I'm meeting this gentleman. Okay, so you spoke to your employee. Yes, my employee. You. He was our middleman. Okay, okay. And, um, okay, why don't you um, let me know what happened that day when, what was his name again? Phil Spencer. Spencer visited your shop. Well, this guy came in. Uh, he asked me uh, for a number of guitars. I think it was 17 uh, used guitars and wanted decent ones. Decent Had you ones. ever met him before? Never. So uh, he wanted these used guitars, uh, very decent quality, he said, decent quality. And I said, uh, okay, uh, you know, kind of tall order because, you know, most of the guitars we get in are real junk. So I had to go, uh, I told him it's going to take me a little while, I search around, go on the internet, blah, blah, blah. And um, next thing you know, uh, I got all the guitars, you know. And I called him up, he said he didn't need it until like, I don't know, July, I think, 21st. So, uh, we didn't have a deadline other than that. So as soon as I got my, uh, the last guitar, which I tried out, I mean, I got plenty of them, and I sent some of them back. But 
um, because they weren't good. Now, you sent other ones back because they weren't good, but right. you kept some. Okay. Um, did Mr. Spencer tell you what what they be used for? How what kind of condition they'd have to be in? He said decent, playable. And to you, what does that mean? That means uh, decent and playable. It means you know you plug it in, bing bang boom, it's uh, music comes out. Uh, but, one second, did you know what these guitars were going to be used for specifically? He said that they were going to have some kind of a contest or something, and they were going to be giving the guitars away. Yeah, he said something, yeah. Okay. I know for a fact, Your Honor, that Phil went in there explaining that they were going to be used in an outdoor setting. Therefore, they had to be amplified. Yeah, he told me that. Okay, so when a guitar is played, it has to go past volume five in order to work. The distortion, Your Honor, was so intense, dogs were coming from three counties around with this high-frequency noise. I mean, it was incredible. Decent fun. shape? Decent. They weren't all decent. They weren't working. Well, first of all, uh, Phil Spector, or Sp Spencer, whatever his name was, who we tried to act like, come into the place and he plugged them all in and uh, try to write in my shop, and it's not, I mean, he went Inside wild. your shop? Of course. Well, listen, we didn't, we didn't take it out on to uh, 8th Street. I mean, and he plugged them all in, and each one that he tried worked and was fine. No distortion whatsoever, not in my shop. Mr. Raven, yeah. let me ask you this. How long have you been in business? 20, 22 years. And <laughs> what is your return policy? My, my return policy on brand new items uh, is, is the uh, manufacturer's warranty. On used items, I got a big sign right over, uh, right, right over to my uh, cashier. It says, it says uh, no return policy, no return at all on used merchandise. You have a sign stating no return on used items. Thing that we trust. Okay. Um, you are, if I may say something else, I understand that there's a sign there, but Usually when you promise something, that's what you're supposed to get, okay? So if he said it was in decent shape, then they should be functioning. And nine of those guitars were not functioning. That's more than half. Now, when you say not functioning, you couldn't, you couldn't use them to give them away? Well, no. Well, that's the problem. We were at the concert. We had the sound check. And the band started to turn them up past volume five. And it was like a, a Nirvana concert. I don't know if you know that hard rock metal uh, band, but... It was, it was not plausible to the ears. And, and my, my bands that I represent were very upset. They did not get to perform the way they needed to perform. Okay, um, ideally, what would you like to, how would you like to resolve this matter? Well, I would like to be compensated for those nine guitars, which I think is approximately $437 per guitar. Um, out of the $7,500, it's uh, about $3,933, <laughs> roughly. Um, okay. But to be honest with you, I, I, I would, I, the reason I'm here is I would like him to at least get more than that, a, a slap on the wrist. I mean, this is a shady proprietor and a, and a shady merchant. Where Who knows where he got these guitars? They could have fallen off of a truck on their way to a repair shop or to a guitar funeral or something because... They were not working, Your Honor, and, okay. and I've lost a say... lot more than, than the, the financial aspect. Okay. Can um, I say something here? Yes, Mr. What? Raven. Oh, well, I just want to say that, first of all, I don't know who she has on the bill, but all I know is that a lot of musicians that come into my shop are morons. They don't even know where to plug a guitar in. These are professional musicians. Well, okay. all right, two things. Number one, I don't know who these people are, whether they plug it into the wrong hole or not. Number one, maybe they put it into the distortion. Number two, I don't know what kind of answer. So are you using. saying that you think that they possibly could have damaged the guitars after they left your shop? Without question. Are you kidding me? Listen, this Phil Spectrum guy that was in there Spencer. plugged every single guitar in, and every one of them was working, and he wrapped them up and took them with him. I mean, personally, I think that... If they weren't working to his satisfaction, he should have said something like that in there before we went through the transaction. All right, I've heard enough. I will return with my ruling. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.
now, this is your client now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Who will win? If you think Denise is going to win, choose A. If you think head spin will win, choose B. whether you want to make yourself a deal memo. Because see, that's what I did. I went through and I listened to the evidence and made myself a deal memo. You may need to take your term sheet and do that just so you can have something that you can use to go through uh, with your, um, you know, when you start drafting your agreement. It's up to you if you think you can get it all from the term sheet and from the client interview. Uh, but I like to have all of my stuff all on one piece of paper so that I can go down the list. I, and me personally, I would even take my instructions, my student instructions or whatever formatting, I put it all in one place so that I can just use that one document to go by when the time comes for me to start drafting my agreement. And so in our prior classes, I'm just using this as uh, a type of a uh, exercise so that we can get practice on doing this uh, I'm asking based on my prior suggestions what is the first thing you would do to prepare drafting the agreement anybody the first thing you're going to do yes ma'am um, look at what section I'm going to be adding absolutely yes that's the first thing I would, I would do I'm going to go and find my little deal memo and I'll say, oh, here is my format. I'm going to go and set that up. Okay? So I'm going to go and do something like this. I'm just going to set it all up. Go down my list, make sure I have all of the sections that I need. Okay? Sometimes what I find with, like on one exercise, like the, was it the past exercise, we were asking about the action section. Sometimes I'll have students, they'll try to just throw everything with the kitchen sink in there, but that does not communicate to me that you know that we're talking about the action section. So I just need you, so don't go and try to get a, uh, a form and use a form and then put everything that you find in that form. Let's focus on the formatting, the sections that we're told that we need to use for when the time comes for our transaction. And if I were you, I would just go and set that document up. So everything, all I got to do now is just put, plug in my pieces. So then that's the first thing I'm going to do. So now, based on my prior suggestions, suggestions now, what is the next thing you will do to prepare drafting the agreement? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, that's great. Yes, I definitely. 
definitely would do that. Definitely next. Uh, then what? Because now what? I have it. I have it all set up here. So then, what's next? So what, what do we call that? The introductory provision. Boom. See, this is what I'm trying to get across to you all. You see, you got to have, see for me, when I get ready to do anything that I do right now in the law, I, it's, I've been doing the same thing for 15 years. Whenever it's time for me to do discovery, I'm going to do the same thing. Whenever it's time for me to do a motion, I'm going to do the same thing. When it's time for me to do an agreement, you need to come up with a template way that when you sit down, you don't, you're not spinning, you're not reinventing the wheel to do something. So you want to go down, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time, you, wanna, you already know what you're going to do. First thing I'm going to do, get my four manuscript. Then I'm going to straight into my introductory provisions, okay? All right? And so then, so now that I'm talking about my introductory pr provisions, what am I going to need for the introductory provisions? Yes, ma'am. Who the parties are and who, like, if they're a corporation, who's representing that okay. corporation? Uh, okay. Let's start from the basics, the basic parts of the introductory provisions. Yes, ma'am. Yes. See, I'm going to go straight there in my brain. I need to go straight there in my brain. I need to have, I'm just going to go down the list, down my little, my little flow chart. So we got our preamble recitals, and words of agreement. I already know that's what I'm going to need for my introductory provisions. I'm going step by step. Okay, so with this in mind, then what am I going to do next? Yes, ma'am? The definition? Oh, wait. No, okay. Now that I have this in mind, I'm still on the introductory provisions. Oh, we're going to write them? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was, I was... <laughs> so we're going to start with the first part of the introductory provisions, the preamble, what is needed for the preamble. So that's when we're going to start on the preamble. It's going to go boom. See, because now you have it, you have it, it's visualized for you. I mean, you got to go, I would, that's how I would do it. This is all I'm saying. This is my suggestion. And so you're going to ask now, what do I need for the preamble? Now tell me. The parties. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, but tell me in the but but this is what I would do if I were you. I would t I would go in the you know what do we need for our preamble? What things? I would go boom 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 bing 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 bang boom. <laughs> what type of agreement it is? Okay. Then what? Between whom? Okay. What comes after that part? The date. The date of the agreement. The date. Okay. okay. So you need the name of the agreement, then you need the, the date. Just the, see, I think we get kind of, we get kind of, we're going to talk about this date because we're kind of, we're just the date. <laughs> and then what? The parties. The parties. Name of the agreement, date, parties. I mean, it's the same thing over and over for me. I mean, I, I just, you got to fix it in your mind how you're going to do it. Each time you do it the same way. All right. So now what am I going to do first? Now that I have this, what am I going to do? Work on what? <laughs> what am I going to work on? Huh? Name of the agreement? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, thought we were, I thought we were done with this. Yes. Oh, we're going to be done. Have you named it yet? Uh, okay. No, I have not. <laughs> okay. So this is what we're working on. And what, okay, so what are we still, we're still in our, we're in the, what section? Introductory. The provisions, but we're still, work, we got to get the preamble done. Okay, so these are the things we need for the preamble. Okay. And so where are we going to get this information from? Our memo. From the memo. 
or from term sheets, maybe information from the client interview. If you're letting it be just like you're going to just go and get pieces from everywhere, I wouldn't do that. I would try to find a way to put it all in one place. So it's going to be the deal memo. It might be the client email. It might be the term sheet. Okay. So me, I'm going to get my little information, put it all together. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to highlight, uh, isolate the relevant information. And so I'm just going to say this again. I can't say it too many times. Because right? if you're using that term sheet or whatever you're using, you want to read, 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 and reread that information. Because you want to make sure that you haven't left anything out, that you're not misrepresenting or misunderstanding the client's goals. Because that's the most important thing. And that is going to be used in every single provision that we write. So we want to make sure that we are having an understanding of what's going on in that client note. Okay. So what does the deal memo say about the date? And then we want to ask, what does the deal memo say about the identification of the parties? Okay, because these are the things, the three things we need for that preamble. And then when we get ready to uh, deal with the party's information, we are told that we need to identify the party, the parties, and define the parties. And so right here in our deal memo, it tells us who the parties are. It tells us the closing date, because that's going to be the date when everything happens. I mean, the party's going to sign the agreement, you know, it's, that's it. For me, now, you may find that you may need to have some type of uh, as is, I'm not, uh, as of uh, effective date. But for me, I'm just going to, just based on the information we have, we only have one date, July 21st. We just let that be the date that any representations will be made or anything like that would be as of the closing date. Uh, and so we have enough information, I feel like we have enough information right there to deal with the preamble. Okay, so what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to Do a name of your agreement. So what name do you want to give it? <laughs> okay. That sounds good to me. I'm just going one, two, three. I'm just highlighting it that way so you can see the three pieces mm -hmm. of information. I am, I, I, I think I want to call it the bulk use guitar purchase agreement uh, for a whole lot of different reasons. I want to clearly identify that they're used. And then at some point, I want to 
uh, communicate maybe that this is not an individual cell, this is not a piecemeal, this is going to be take it or leave it, uh, a whole lot, all 17, or, you know, because you get into to problems where you have a person that want to sue you and they want to come back and get damages for a nine or whatever the case may be. No, it was a sale of 17. Uh, and so it's the whole lot, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, there could be some reasons that a client would want to, to do that. So I, I, at this point in the beginning stages, my mind is starting to work. I'm starting to say, I want to say bulk use guitar purchase agreement. And then uh, remember that the, uh, the, the names that, this is how we uh, provide the names, we uh, identify, okay? Lenny's Music Inc., a California corporation, Lenny's or Seller, it's up to you how you want to define that part. But then you would need to use that all throughout the agreement now. Because when you get down to the definitions, as I would do, and define them again, you don't want to have them, they're not going to have a different name now. Whatever you choose here, that's going to be the same throughout. And Head Spin Records, LLC, a California limited liability company. Head Spin. Yes, ma'am. So you want like the Lenny's music and the Headspin records folded? Uh, I, it's not, I mean, it's up to you. Okay. That's just style for me. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to do that. That's, that's fine. Because once you, just make sure you are following the parameters that you've been given, but other little style things, I'm fine. You know, I've seen some very professional things. And so again, remember, once we name the agreement, then we're going to go ahead and put it up there in the title. And then we know that, you know, the closing for this particular transaction is going to be July 21st. So everything is going to happen on that date, signing everything. So dated July 21st. So I'm going to stop here. There's a lot of confusion for some reason about the date. And so I want to see as much as possible if I can clear this up, is there a question? Mm -hmm. It says to confirm the date used in the preamble. Should the date used in the preamble be the signing date? Yes. As opposed to the closing date or date of drafting. It, in every case, it's going to be the date that the first person signed it. Now, somebody said the drafting date. It can't be the drafting date. It has to be the date that the parties entered into the agreement. I am telling you that I would not use this bulk use guitar purchase agreement uh, dated as of. I would not use an as of date in the preamble because that has a specific meaning. It is a date that relates back for like representations and warranties, it could be that last week you made a representation to me that uh, induced me to want to enter into the agreement with you. And so at that point, there may be some desire to have some of the uh, provisions, the representations and warranties to date back to that effective, that as of date. I would not put that in the preamble because that gets confusing. Because the date of closing may be a totally different date. If there's going to be an as of date, there will be a definition of some type later on in the agreement down in definitions that will say the effective date or as of date, whatever you want to call it, is this date. And then when you go into your representations, you will say something like the, this representation was made as of the effective date, which could be a week or two a a month before this actual agreement was actually uh, finalized by the parties. So I would not get all confused with that whole confusion when it would just be the date that the first party, party the first person is going to sign. It could be that um, I'm the one that's drafting it on the Lenny side, and so Lenny's going to sign it. So that's going to be, I'm going to be able to say dated as of that day. If it's not an agreement that has a closing, because not all have closings. 
Not every transaction has a closing. The licensing agreement, there was nothing to close. So there's not going to be a, a closing date. Yes, ma'am. Um, so there's no closing Yeah, that's what I would. The deal memo is going to say when, like, in the uh, Ralph's, it, it was dated, the deal memo was dated, I believe, April 21. It says, assume we're going to sign it tomorrow. That's going to be the date of the agreement because there's no closing in that agreement. So then that is going to be my date. If there is any, uh, like, because there could be a whole myriad of, of different types of dates in an agreement. Whatever those are, you will want to specify those in the definitions, but they have nothing to do with this date here that's in the preamble, because it is the date that uh, represents the date that the parties entered into the agreement. Yes, ma'am. In the Ralph's deal, it also said something about um, like the deal not going into effect until like the next month, like the first of next month. That would be the term, but that's different. That's not this date. Okay. So that would be when we define the term of the agreement. Remember, that goes where? In the definition. In the, the term. Okay. Now, I asked you to, you know, give me a definition of but did we have, but our term goes in the action section. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, if there is a closing date, do you want that to be the date of the preamble versus, like, the signing date? It depends because it, you know, um, I would think, me personally, that it that it would be because I am going to have all you know. Everybody's gonna. I'm gonna call your attorney. And you're gonna help. We're gonna do it on this the closing date. So that's that's gonna be for me nine times out of ten. The closing date is probably gonna be the date that I'm gonna have it. But based on all the information, he said he's coming in on the twenty first. So. It's the 21st for our deal. But it's possible that there is a closing date, and it could be that there may be some situation where I can't imagine what it is. I personally would date the agreement the date that the first person signs it. That's just me, though, because it's just less confusion. The book does give you the option of using as of dates. And as of date, or, you know, a, the, this date is always going to be the date that the, at least the first person signed it. That's the date that the, uh, the parties entered into the agreement. Some people may say, uh, dated, I just wouldn't do it. Because you're going to end up with a blank. Some people will say that the agreement is consummated on the date that the last person signed it, you don't need that. I think I got a question like that. Would the agreement not be valid? The agreement is, is, is enforceable on the date that the first person signed it. Eventually, even if that other party does not sign for some time after, if that's okay with the parties, whenever that person signs it, it's fine, but it's still an enforceable agreement I wouldn't let months go by for the other party to sign it. Um, that definitely would be something that the parties would definitely have a talk about. Uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, send it to you. You're going to sign it and email it back to me. That can happen the same day. We, you know, we don't live in times where, you know, we have email. So the other person can sign it, send it back, and send the original signature, in, you know, in overnight mail or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to give it a date so that there is no, it has to, the, the agreement needs a date. And so to cut down on the confusion, definitely not, I don't want to put the as of date in the preamble. It creates too much confusion. And some agreements don't have an as of date. Here, any representations that would be made to me, they would be made on the 21st. So we don't have any of that problem anyway. We got one day. Are there any other questions about that? Please do not hesitate to ask questions about that because really and truly, 
and I mean, don't and don't feel bad, but it I have to do a good job, <laughs> and so I need to make sure that you're getting that point. And so to me, I need to go back and keep trying again if what I'm saying about this is not clear. Yes. So if you did like in an instance where a warranty or representation was made and it needed to be like retro, it needed to be as of a certain date. Okay. Would you put that as of date just specifically in the warranty section? Do you think that would you be most clear? You can put it in the warranties, okay. definitely. I personally would put it in the definitions. Okay. I just would put it in the definitions because there may be some other instance throughout that mm -hmm. uh, agreement where I need to relate back to that as of date for okay. some other reason. Uh, hold on. Yes, ma'am. I think my question kind of similar. I was wondering if you have the measure of limitations. We have the discretion of just using one date. Because that's when we want. We want to be represented as of the date that we're signing it. If we have the choice. Unless. No. Uh, it depends on what the deal says. Uh, like. Um, in. Uh, what was the stone agreement? Mm -hmm. So. Those people had talked before then. So you definitely want that to relate back to a date and, and you know, if we're not specifically given one, uh, you want to at least date it back to the date that the client sent their email. I mean, you want to, I would like to see that you understand this concept. And so it's, I mean, it's fine, I guess, to say that the representation is made as of the time of closing or, you know, as of the date of signing, whatever it may be, but for your client's sake, it's going to benefit them to have that this representation was what induced me, I relied on this, to enter into the agreement. And that is what representations are. They are promises that are made that predate up until the date that the agreement is entered into by the parties. So that's what that is for. So, you know, you want to define it somewhere in the representations or in the definitions. I would put it in definitions. I would put the effective date, as of date, whatever you want to call it. That's what that means. Okay? Is that something you also put in the recitals? Like being no, I would not put it in the recitals because the recitals does not bind anything. Okay. I mean, in addition to... You can put it in the recitals, okay? But you want to make sure that you put it somewhere else in the contract, in the definitions, or the representations and warranties, in a place where it will bind the, the party for sure. But if you just want to get background information uh, there that the party, you know, on such and such date, you know, that's fine. But just make sure that you remember that you want to define that effective date. Uh, in a place where it matters. Okay, yes, sir. Um, what about in the instance of like a purchase of rights to a story or something, and you're sending the, your contract that you wrote up to the other person's attorney to review? Um, what date would you put on? Would it be the one when you wrote the contract no, up? No, because even that's, that's, it? that's just drafts going back and forth. Okay. When it is finalized by either one of you, yeah. it's going to need to have a date in the preamble. So just leave it blank at that point. Yeah, because it's not a final agreement at that. Yeah. See, uh, this is one of those situations. Now we, you know, met. We know when the closing will be. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so, these are drafts going back and forth. Drafts are going to be going back and forth in our transactions as well. At some point, there's going to be a finalized agreement. That agreement has to be ready to go. And that is why I'm giving you this suggestion because you don't want, you never want a, a, a blank in the preamble. Okay, are there any other questions about this date? That's a popular question. But I'll take a hundred more if you have it. If you think of one, put it on your exit ticket or make sure you let me know. Don't let, you know, the time come for the transaction, you don't have your question answered. Okay. All right, so moving right along. Okay. 
Okay, so are we finished with that preamble? Now what? Now that we've finished with our preamble, we're still in our introductory provisions, what's next? Recitals. Recitals and then what? Words of agreement. Yes. Excellent. All right. This is a good time to do what again? Read, 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 read. And I think this is a good opportunity, the recitals, to get a good understanding of what we're doing. I mean, I would, if I were you, you know, once you get everything set up and everything, I would spend some time on the recitals. That's going to help you with the other provisions because then you'll be like, oh, wait, oh, okay. It helps you to set things up in your mind. These are just some other details about our recitals. The recitals describe the background purpose of the agreement. And then our words of agreement will come right after. So the recitals, they follow immediately after the preamble. And then the words of agreement follow immediately after the recitals. Gives you a recitation of a consideration. I know, uh, you know, that it's confusing when you use that word, but these are the exchange of promises of the parts. And so what I like to do is I like to kind of think about what I'm going to be putting in that subject matter performance provision. And this is going to be almost very similar. And then a statement that the parties agree as follows. Okay, so now that I want you all to take a few minutes and to uh, work on some recitals for Lenny's agreement. Like maybe five minutes. Okay, so mm -hmm. somebody start us off. Yes. Um, I would start by saying um, Lenny Raven is a small business owner yes, um, of Lenny's Music selling new and used musical instruments at its mom and pop store in Los Angeles, California. Okay. Uh, and, and, I mean, you can be that specific or you could just, just, you know, just say that it's a, you know, a small business selling new and used uh, musical instruments. Okay, what, what else? That's real good. So you got to go back. You want to go back and lay the foundation for yourself. You want to do this even with your transaction because this is going to help you to figure out the goals, actually, of the client. Okay, so what's, what's next, anybody? Yes, we said that uh, Lenny's Music Inc. has a strict no returns, no refunds policy for used musical instruments. Okay. Now, okay, so I would want to go back a step and say, and why? Why does he have it? Because he, the business has a tight profit margin and cannot afford to suffer any loss or anything. I, I, would, I would say something about that in there because that will explain, you know, why you know why he has this, this this policy, and then next I would say you know I would either put in that sentence also uh, that he doesn't you know uh, that he sells used merchandise as is and he does not uh, take refunds on used merchandise. Okay, now what's next? Okay. So after our no returns, we went to Headspin Records. Absolutely. Okay, what are you going to say about that? And our first one was Headspin Records. LLC is a record label in Los Angeles, California, that supports up-and-coming artists. Absolutely. What else? And then our, after that, we put the Headspin Records. LLC often promotes the artists by having concerts. Okay. Uh, well, and then the last one was... Um, Headspin, Headspin Records LLC has an upcoming promotional outdoor concert um, where the artists will use, perform using used guitars that the artists will autograph and Headspin will give away to members of the audience. Okay, very good. Okay, then what? 
Then when we go into, you know, Headspin is interesting in purchasing 17 used guitars from a Lenny store. Okay, 17, what kind? Used. used. Okay. Yeah. Used and, yes ma'am? Functioning. Okay, but what was that word they kept using? Decent. 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 Okay. I mean, they said decent. Decent and playable. But later on, we will define what decent means. Yes ma'am? Oh, I was going to ask that. What yes. Yes, we would. Because she said decent. I mean, really, what she want? I mean, you better come in there and tell me what you want. Otherwise, you're going to get decent. Yes, ma'am. I have a um, formatting question. Okay. So if I had more than nine recitals, uh -huh. then would I do like 1.9.1? No, somebody asking a question. 1.10. Oh, 1.10. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Common sense, but I just didn't connect. <laughs> What a one point what's it just one point one oh? Wouldn't okay. that be the same as one point one? It's one point yeah, it ten. It, it, it would be. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I mean that was my same question. Yeah. I wrote on the one point one oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One point one oh is decent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking one point one. Yeah. Math math. Yeah. You can do it that way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking way too far into it. Yeah, you can do it that way, but eventually you're going to need 1.2, which will come later because that's okay. 1. Point, that's 1.20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you want to go ahead. 1.10 All right. But we're not going. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to have uh, that have that many though. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now what? Now what's coming next? Yes, ma'am. Um. I'm sorry, really quick question again. Um, because we don't, you said you don't, we don't want that many. Should we make them like kind of bulky, like having three or so of facts kind of in one, or should we really break it down to like one fact per bullet point thing? Uh, well, it's just up to you. It depends on what goes with what. that maybe, you know, it goes with, but you don't have to have so many words in it. You just want to get the idea across. Linus is in the business of selling new and used musical instruments. In order to avoid incurring financial loss and their liability, Linus sells, sells, sells all used merchandise on an as-is basis, and as such, does, it should be, does not provide a refund. Headspin is a record label company that seeks to purchase 17 used guitars of decent quality for an upcoming promotional concert event, which Headspin intends to give away, uh, give away at its conclusion. After inspection at Lenny's store, Headspin seeks to purchase 17. See, I want to really play up this idea of after inspection. Later on, we're going to deal with that. But the fact of the matter is they're going to inspect those. That's going to be a point of uh, contention here to make sure that whatever it is that they're getting, you're gonna have a concert, you're gonna wait until the day of to figure out that the, the girl on guitar don't work? No. So you're gonna come in and you're going to inspect them. Okay, then we're gonna have our words of agreement. As such, this bulk used guitar purchase agreement provides for the sale by Lenny's of 17 used guitars of at least decent quality. <laughs> She'll probably say, no, it's going to be decent quality. But these are, when I send it over to the other side, they're probably going to strike this at least part out. You know, we're going back and forth with our drafts. That's what attorneys do. I'm saying from Lenny's perspective, 
of at least decent quality. Bing, bang, boom. To head spin and for payment of the purchase price by head spin to Lenny's. Accordingly, the parties agree as follows. Well. Yes, ma'am. Um, the words of agreement, do it, does it have to match the subject matter provision or? These okay, so see right here, these are the words of agreement right here. You mean, oh, you mean the, the whole thing? Well, I would do that okay. because that's the consideration. Okay. These are the exchange, the bargain for exchange. That's what consideration is. The exchange, one for another. I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. So now, after the introductory provisions, we're going to start working on the definitions. definitions. So you're going to go by your format. Okay, so based on my prior suggestions, we should start by defining what first. I mean, so you just know right where to plug the next thing in. Start by defining the agreement being drafted. And so you want to also make sure you go back and look at the deal memo, your client email, whatever it is, to make sure that the terms are defined correctly. And remember, you may need to come back and slip a definition in there as you're going on. You're using a term, you may need to come back in and figure out where that definition needs to go. So I'm going to... So we're going to define the agreement. that they're going to be sold as a bulk set. So bulk set shall mean the entire set of 17 used guitars, which will be sold as a collective set. I feel the need to define that. I want to define what guitars mean. Guitars shall mean 17 used guitars of decent quality in the bulk set sold by Lenny's, which are the subject of this agreement. It, it, you know, it could just say shall mean the 17 used guitars of decent quality in the bulk set sold by Lenny's. Decent quality. I'm going to, you know, we need a definition of what that means. Okay. I may send that back over to the other side if we're doing that kind of collaboration with the opposing counsel or whatever case may be. Their definition, they may want to add something. But for me, decent quality shall mean fit, suitable, and of good, marketable, and playable quality, consistent with the purpose for which it was purchased. So later on, you can't come back and say, ah, oh, yeah, he knew, blah, blah, blah. How am I supposed to know that you're having an outdoor concert or whatever the case may be? Even if you mention it, how, am I, how can you assume I know what that means? If you want to come back later on on the other side, whoever wants to represent uh, the other side, they may want to say, they may want to put more things in here that will communicate, ah, oh, it, when it's plugged into the amp, it needs to go up above five and blah, 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 blah. But that's, that's not my client's goal. He's just selling bing, bang, boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he care about. Minis, then I'm gonna, I like to define the parties, you know. They've already been given their defined name. Now I wanna come in here. Lenny shall mean Lenny's Music Inc. at California Corporation, which is the seller of the bulk set of guitars. Now I know what the bulk set is. Bulk set of guitars, 
guitars that use the guitars of decent quality that's already been defined. And then head spin, head spin shall mean head spin records, LLC, a California Limited Liability Corporation, which is the buyer of the bulk set of guitars. Inspection, that's going to be important for me. Because you come in and you're going to inspect it, and then that should mean something. Inspection shall mean the inspection and closing of each of the guitars conducted by Headspin's manager slash officer with authority to sign this agreement to determine if the guitars are of decent quality. So you can't send your middleman and then come and tell the judge, I know he said so. You wouldn't even know. How do you know what he said? How do you know what he thought? You come down. You're going to sign this agreement. You're going to inspect them. Because once you accept them, then you can't come back and sue me late and say it was not. Whatever the definition of decent is, that we're going to understand what that means. Because when you leave with them, that means they're decent. Cash shall mean certified funds in the form of cash or a cashier's check. Any other definitions that you all can think of that would be needed? Okay. Yes, ma'am. For, for cash, like so for our ski lift agreement, or really any agreement, um, could you say wire transfer or anything like that? Uh, it, it probably could be. But for this, you know, this is a mom and pop short shop. We're not going to do a wire transfer, but something big, a million dollars, something like that, well, somebody's not going to show up with a million dollars. So in that particular case, it, it just depends on what the deal says. Uh, but at some point, some parts of that money are going to be somewhere else, we know. Uh, and then however the other parts, however that money, you know, it's going to get there. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be actually cash in the form of cash as is stated here for that particular deal. A deal with that kind of money, and you know, it could be that some of it may be, uh, you may, some of it may be paid uh, in a wire transfer. Let's say some deals you may pay, a, let's say it's a $2 million deal. A million dollars is going to be paid uh, by wire transfer, and then you may sign a note for the other million dollars. It's just different kinds of ways. Uh, it may not be a cash deal, so to speak, like you know, buying a used car or or something like that. That's you know, under a couple hundred thousand dollars or under several thousand dollars. Uh, so cash in that sense may be something different for different deals. But whatever the understanding is in the terms here, wherever the money's gonna come from, we wanna make sure that we're, you know, you wanna define, you wanna define it. It may not be cash. These smaller deals that we've been dealing with lately, like the stove agreement, this, you know, it can be, you know, cash. Now, uh, where there's going to be some money that is going to be paid in royalties, uh, it may not necessarily be cash. It may be certified funds. It may be, uh, who knows, you know, however it's going to get there. But it. You want to define it in some way so that there is no confusion later on. Somebody comes and sends you a, uh, a personal check and they mail it to you. You don't, if that's not the form of cash or the form of payment or whatever it is that you, it may be that you don't need a definition here for cash. Are there any other questions about that? Okay.
Okay, so what's next then? business slash action section. And so based on my prior suggestions, we should start by working on what first in this business slash action section? Subject matter performance. Uh, so what do we, okay, so we have the business slash action mm -hmm. section. So we're going to start on what first? Action section, what are we going to start with first? Is it the subject matter? No. Okay. <laughs> That's not right. Okay. Mm. The business slash action section, what are we going to start with first? Business section? Have we all started with the business first? <laughs> no. Definitely not. Well, what are we starting with? Action okay. section. No. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it's like I've been saying the same thing five weeks. We start by working on the action section first. And then, ma'am, now what is the first part of the action section? If you don't understand the language, then you got to because then that, that's the way that you're going to be able to snap through. And, and, and so business actions, we're going to start with the... Actions. actions first, and then the first part of the actions are what? What are the first two provisions of the actions? The subject matter provision. Performance. Performance. And yes. then what? Payment. Then payment. Y'all make me think I'm talking in another language. <laughs> <laughs> Have I not said that really? Yeah. Have I not said that? No? And so you just answer my question. Subject matter performance provision and the payment provision. Really, this is what, I mean, this is the basis of the whole agreement. Okay. Now, uh, so when we did that exercise, that didn't really come across to me that we really got that because we did, we worked on the action section. That's what chapter eight was about. And so I got all kinds, of, I got like general provisions and people had all kinds of things in there where we're just dealing with the action section. Okay. And then, so the first two things that I would want you to kick in with when we're talking about the action section, we want to start with that subject matter uh, performance provision and then the payment provision. Okay, so now this subject matter performance provision, uh, and see, I think maybe I'm confusing you here, but it is a covenant, a promise to perform the main subject of the main subject matter of the agreement. Uh, but you have to have two of them because there are two parties. Now, there can be two types of promises that can be included in the subject matter performance provision. It's going to be one or the other for each one of those parties. I think that kind of got uh, lost in the translation, but I have been, but I really have been saying it for five weeks now, so I want to get it clear now. What are these two types of promises? And you cannot answer, ma'am. Not you. <laughs> you can't answer. <laughs> you know it now. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It can be, I'm going to buy, you're going to sell. Okay, but if it's a licensing agreement, I'm not, I mean, how am I going to, I know you saw me say this on some of the papers, I said, how are you going to perform this? By what? Sometimes you make me think you're raising your hand. Sorry. <laughs> By what? So they can be reciprocal or self-executing. Reciprocal or self-executing. So Ralph's promise can either be reciprocal or self-executing, but then I need to have merchandisers promise as well. It needs to be communicated in this subject matter performance provision, both of them. And some of the 
papers, I got one promise. Rouse, uh, this agreement and this agreement, Rouse will license, and then that was it. That was it. You got to have both. And so when you have that self-executing type of promise, there is no actual performance that Ralph, I mean, it's his agreement. He's going to, you know, be given a right to license. So it's going to be a self-executing type of a promise. By signing this agreement, that's Ralph's performance, okay? By signing this agreement, Ralph grants the actual doing of that promise comes in the signing of the agreement. By signing the agreement, then he will grant Ralph's, or uh, Ralph's will grant merchandise as a license to use the Ralph trademark image on caps and t-shirts during the license term. And, and now I need to know uh, uh, what merchandise is going to do. And during the license term, merchandisers shall manufacture, market, and sell caps and t-shirts bearing the Ralph trademark image in the license territory. So I need both of those. Are there any questions about that? Okay. And so what comes after the subject matter performance provision? Immediately after, then I need to uh, you know, I say to myself, after that, then show me the money. I need to see the money. It can be done in one or two ways. You can have one uh, covenant, or you can have a declaration and covenant combo, which is what I like. I like to uh, have a declaration that states what the amount of money is, and then I come back with the promise to pay that amount. I like the declaration and the covenant combo. Whichever one you choose, it needs to answer who is paying what, to who, how, and when. You gotta have all of those questions need to be answered in that payment provision so that there is no person who is having any type of misunderstanding as to how you're gonna make sure the money gets into my bank account. And so where do we find this information? We will find that information in the deal memo. And so what does it say? So with that being said, then you should be able to answer uh, most of the questions that need to be answered here. So I'm going to state how much the purchase price for the bulk set of guitars is $7,500. And then hands Ben shall pay Lenny's the purchase price in cash at closing. I know how much, I know who is going to be paid to who. I know uh, how in cash and when at closing. action section so I'm going to go ahead and define what closing is. Closing shall take place at Lenny's Los Angeles store on July 21st, 2018. Closing date at 10 o'clock a.m. Los Angeles time. 
and shall mean the concluding meeting to take place between Lenny's and Handspin, at which time Lenny's will deliver to Handspin the box set of guitars and payment receipt, and Handspin will deliver to Lenny's the purchase price payable in cash. Closing deliveries. At closing, Lenny's shall deliver to Handspin a payment receipt with working payment for and Handspin's payment for the bulk guitars, I should say, and Handspin's ownership Payment for and Headspin's ownership, this is what it's going to reflect. Payment for and Headspin's ownership of the guitars. Because then this payment receipt is going to be the document that's going to transfer the ownership document, so to speak. Like a bill of sale. After Headspin delivers to Lenny the payment price. Closing delivery. You can state it in two sentences. And so these are also, remember, some other items that are included in your action section. Now, I asked you in your extra credit to define, uh, I believe I did ask you to define the license term, okay, which is fine. You put that in your definitions, realizing that uh, what you'll end up doing is you'll move it to your action section. There will be times you'll put a definition somewhere and you may need to move it. There are declarations that maybe is not necessarily 100% that it has to be in the definitions. Okay? So I will take that term now that you have it and I will move it down into your action section. Yes, ma'am. When you say move it, you don't mean duplicate it and keep it in bulk. You mean take it out of the I will take it out and okay. put it in one place. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and then for instances where there are closings, then you'll have your closing date and your closing deliveries, but not every contract has that. Keep that in mind. And so remember... Uh, let me just stay on this for a second just so I can show you how. Yes. So just to confirm, so for example, in what you had on the board under closing, you also define a closing date within that. Is that, okay. is that okay to That's do that? Okay. So instead of having a, a closing okay. date in the definition, you can then define it when it becomes relevant down there and yes. then refer to a closing date later on. Yes. Okay. You can do that in a minute. You can do that in, in other instances as well okay. where you need to. It just seems to be a little cumbersome. To, de to define closing date up there when I need to just, I need to put it all together in one place. And so uh, at some point, uh, I may need to use closing date as a definition. Uh, me personally, I would probably say at the time of closing so that whatever it is, it will relate to the closing, which could be, you know, uh, it's going to be that same date, but it may be at a time later on in the day or whatever the case may be, I want to say closing at the time of closing rather than closing date, which may be, I just want to say at the time of closing. At that time, that's when this becomes uh, relevant. And so once we finish these things, okay, so see when I'm talking about business size action section, when I was, I was, you know, I know it seemed like nitpicky, but I needed to get that definition. I needed to get that definition out to you so you could understand these are two separate things within one section. We're going to start with the actions first. Then we're going to move in that same section. Then we're going to deal with our business sections, which is mostly everything else. All in this one section. So now we have our actions taken care of.
I'll put that in here somewhere. And, and I'll show you that when we look at uh, the licensing agreement. But I will put that there. And then everything else now is going to be business sections, business provisions of the business slash action section. We've taken care of our action portion. The actions are going to go first. And then now we're going to deal with our business sections, which could be any of the other covenants, conditions, uh, rights, you know, obviously the uh, covenants are going to, you know, provide those obligations and whatever else, all of that, I would just go ahead and throw it into this section and then get to my representations and warranties. So I'm just going to move through this. You know, these are just some things that will come to mind at the time of closing has been shall conduct an inspection. Because this is going to be what's going to release him from liability. An inspection of each of the guitars and once accepted for purchase, Lenny's will be released from any and all liability. And will have the right to assert as a matter of law. That the guitars are fit. I mean, as a matter of law, she said, okay, they were not fit for what they were. No judge, as a matter of law, he in the agreement, once she accepted them, as a matter of law, they became fit for whatever purpose she had. We agreed to that judge. See, they were not even be in that situation because there was no agreement. That's why they ended up in front of the judge. But see, we're going to fix that. And then I'm going to say, we're not going to be here anyway because we're going to have an arbitration agreement. Lenny's and Hespin agree that all claims or disputes shall be resolved in arbitration conducted by the American Arbitration Association in Los Angeles, California, with 50% of the arbitration fees and expenses to be paid by Lenny's and 50% to be paid by Hespin. Take care of that. Our client's goal was what? To keep him from what? To stay out of court. That's what we have to do. That's our job. And so it's not necessary that you have to have all these different, you know, sections and blah, blah, blah. This is our business section. Just put it right on in there. Now, since we don't have an identification section for this agreement, I'm going to put my defense identification right here in my business section. If either party files suit in a court of law, the filing party shall defend and then find the other party. This is what happens to Stormy Daniels, because if she, if she knows, she go over there and file that court, she going to file that case, she going to pay my expenses and my attorney's fees, she going to think twice. And shall be liable for all costs of suit, court expenses, and attorney's fees, which shall be taxed and entered as a final judgment in favor of the non-filing party against the filing party. These are just examples for you to see how you can take an agreement and and the, that's the purpose to stay out there. Yes, ma'am. So in terms in Washington House we have still uh, I know that it was wrong to like have these like, under like a general heading that was like additional provisions, but in real life, would it make sense to have like a separate heading that just says like additional provisions? Uh you mean like that? that section that we do have that says general provisions, but that we just didn't use right, for like that transition. Like in the list. Right, mm -hmm. right. So when you are going by a strict format, then the, you can put it here. Yeah, there is no reason why, because this is the business section. Yeah. Now, you know, later on, when we have all those different sections, like this section we will go into the identification section mm -hmm. or general, a general provisions section. That catch-all is where those things will go. Yeah. Okay. I got to move through this. I get to the representations and warranties. Okay. All right. So now that we've, you know, gone through that, we're going to talk a little bit more about it uh, once if we have time. Uh, with uh, round 
last deal uh, about all of the different things, Steve. I'll show you how your uh, representations and your warranties uh, may create some type of a covenant or obligation uh, that would then need to go up into that business section. Uh, but after we finish that business section, then we want to do what now? Our representations and our warranties. And so now we uh, should have an understanding of those uh, representations and warranties uh, enough to be able to uh, move into that section. And so uh, what I also wanted to communicate, I'll get, get back into this again, is that those represent representations and warranties are promises that are made maybe as of the date of the agreement or maybe sometime prior to that. But these are not promises that will be made in the future. That will be what the covenants are. Covenants that could be up there in the business section somewhere. Namely, that subject matter performance provision, which is the major covenant of the agreement. Uh, but these are promises that are made in reliance, that a person relied on in making their decision to enter into the agreement. And so this is a whole different section. And so uh, here again, uh, you know, it's the promise that the maker of the statement will pay damages. You know, obviously uh, that's the thing that we want to avoid here. And so we want to review our deal memo. We want to make sure that Linus is not exposed to any liability, including breach of express warranty. Because she, she, he thought he was home free when she said, oh, well, there's no breach of express warranty. Yeah, I know, because they didn't have an agreement. <laughs> but she said, ah, but there's going to be, I find, a breach of an implied warranty which is what you can get caught up into. And so we're going to make sure that there will be no breach, there will be no warranty expressed or implied, that that's clearly going to be stated in our uh, representations and warranties. Okay, so then we're going to start with Lenny. And you can have that heading, representation and warranties, but you want to make sure that you don't say Lenny's represent and warrants as follows, because we're not going to do that. We want to make it clear Lenny expressly provides no warranty by way of this agreement, expressed or implied, as the guitars are sold as is and subject to inspection as set forth in Articles 2.6 and 3.5 of this agreement. And then once you go up there, you'll understand that. Once they're inspected, then they're going to be uh, fit for the purpose for which they were sold. And then title. Lenny owns, he wants to represent, he will give a representation that he owns each of the guitars. What I want to do is I understand that people get confused about things. And so... Maybe it wouldn't hurt if I said he represent and warrants that he has title, but I don't want to create any warranty in this agreement. So he will represent that he owns each of the guitars. The guitars are not subject to any lien, and then he will pass good title in the guitars at the time of closing. He can represent that, for sure. And he can represent that the quality are, the, the guitars are decent, playable quality. If somebody wants something more than that, well, that can be a negotiating point. But, uh, you know, I picked this because somebody sent me a question, you know, an email, and I want to make sure that, you know, we're not trying to hide anything. I want to put it out there, and if it's something that you kind of accept in the agreement, then we can maybe negotiate that. But this is where I want to be for the goals of my client. 
And so, you know, you can, I mean, these are all things that can be negotiated. Has been, represents, and warrants as follows. The husband has the financial strength to guarantee his payment of the purchase price at the time of closing. Now, here, I wanted to put this here to show somebody how this looks here, okay? See, I was talking earlier to somebody about this, this collections. When you say if, then when you start saying if, to me, that's a condition. I can put it here because this is my representations and watching, so it's stay it right here close to where this is coming from but you may want to move this up to the business section <coughs> because this is going to relate in some instance to some type of a covenant that will be a promise that may be carried out in the future when our representations of warranties are promises that are made as of it before if payment of the purchase price is returned not payable for any reason, his bin will become liable for all expenses in the future. So I may move this up to my business section. It's fine here. It's okay. Yes, ma'am. Would that be the equivalent of, in the Ralph one, of them saying, like, um, the um, samples where they're like, if... This, if the sample doesn't meet the standard, right. okay, right. like future tense. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So when you say if, if, then it's a condition. So I kind of want to keep, you know, things, uh, if, then this is going to happen in the future. And then you start to uh, ask yourself, is this a walkaway condition or ongoing? I would probably move it up. To the business section. But this is going to protect Lenny's. If something happens, we're going to let her pay that thing with that cashier's check. But if that cashier's check bounces, I need to be able to have, he doesn't want any loss or liability. Yes, ma'am. So, why in this case do you have it in representation? I just have it here because I'm showing you. He's representing, this is the representation that they have the financial strength. They made this representation. They had the financial strength to pay the purchase price. I put it here to show you, just to make this point. But if they don't, in fact, have that financial strength, then these are the results or repercussions. If for whatever reason, because I'm relying on the fact that they can pay that purchase price. If they don't, I need to be able to have something in here to make sure I get my money. So I don't need to put it here. I mean, I, I mean, it's fine there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So would you say, because I know earlier you mentioned that representations and warranties are typically not going to be, they're typically going to be things that exist right now. Yeah, these are representations made that are in reliance, that, that we're relying on, so go ahead. Right, so then are, would you say that you're normally going to have like a correlating um, if-then statement? So in, Yeah, that's what this is. And that applies to like a lot of different representations. I'm just wondering because if every time in a representation and warranty you're saying this is the way that it is, are you then going to have a corresponding statement saying if this is not the way that it is, then here's the result? It's right here. If yeah. this payment is not made, then this is what's going to happen. Okay. Right here. You're going to have this scenario could relate to your subject matter performance provision. A condition that's related to your subject matter performance provision. If something doesn't happen, then this is what will happen. Uh, all I'm saying is I put it here just so you could see where this is coming from. This is how it will be when you get ready to draft your agreement. You will you will have your say you you say this them. Okay, what happens? What if what if they don't? Then you'll put it there. Then you move it to where it should go. Because it's not a, a representation, These, this is going to relate to a uh, result in a covenant, a promise of something that's going to, an uh, obligation that's going to happen, have to happen in the future. So why wouldn't that be a, con a condition? It is. Okay. 
See what I'm saying? See how it gets confusing when we're talking about sections and then we're talking about concepts. And you can have these concepts all throughout this agreement in any different ones of these sections. Okay. What I'm saying is for here, this is just a separate special section of representations and warranties which relate to promises that were made that would not be in the future. Mm -hmm. So you want to put all your future promises somewhere else. Okay. Which include conditions. Gotcha. Oh. Are there any other questions about that? Yes, ma'am. So, um, should we really only choose one place to get a contract in between, or would it be okay to put in that um, warranty section and also in the you're not going to put it in both places. You're going to pick one. Right. Yeah, because then that causes confusion. Yeah. And as I'm saying again, it's, I mean, you want to leave it there. But what I'm saying is that it's not, it's not really correct because the representations, you want to be clear in your mind. These are promises that are made before and up until the, the date of the agreement. And so anything that's going to relate to somebody having to do something in the future, if they default on that provision, which will re result in a promise or some type of an obligation or right that's going to uh, come in the future after the dating agreement, you want to move that up to the business section or it may be in the remedies. But we don't have a remedy section. I'm saying remedies, indemnities section. Remedies and indemnities section. We don't have that here. I've, I've given you your sections here. So it's probably going to have to go in your business uh, slash action section. Okay, so after representations and warranties, then now for this particular format, we're going to move to our conditions to closing. And remember, these are not, see now, we've talked about all different kinds of other conditions, okay? Our concept conditions, but now we're going to talk about our conditions to closing, which is your final check. Uh, typically, this session li lists the requirements to close the deal. Now, there may not be a closing, but every deal has to close. So you're going to have your conditions to close it. And I move this one up because they are that a party has fulfilled its obligations and covenants. And so that is why, first of all, the major obligation and covenant is that subject matter performance provision. And when I have a situation where I'm somebody gives me the subject matter performance provision and it only has one promise in it, then this is not going to be met here in the conditions of closing because when I go back and I look at that con at your subject matter performance provision, your major, major, main obligation and covenant, it's not even, it's only reflected as to one party. It only talks about the fact that Ralph's uh, will give a license of this thing, but it doesn't say what merchandisers will do back up there in that subject matter performance provision. And so this is like your checklist at the end. And so we want to review our deal, memo, email, whatever the case may be, to make sure that we have all of the relevant conditions to closing. And so what I don't like so much is a lot of relating back unless the, when I get back to that thing that it relates to that is actually going to be telling me something. Uh, and so that was a lot of what uh, we had in our last transaction that I want to get away from in this particular transaction. And so getting through some of those com the confusion, confusing wordiness uh, that we had in the last agreement.
So conditions to Lenny's obligations. Lenny's shall perform its obligations as set forth in the subject matter performance provision. You could call it whatever. I mean, it may not be called subject matter performance provision. That's what I'm going to call it because I just want to make sure I'm not confused. In Article 3.0, when you go back up there to Article 3.0, you're going to understand what the obligations are, what Lenny's obligations are, because I made sure I put in there. By signing this agreement, Lenny's is going to do what we Lenny shall perform its obligations as set forth in the subject matter performance division in Article 3.0 of this agreement if, if, if each of the following conditions has been met. Has been representations of warranty set forth in Articles 4.1 and 4.11 must have been true at the time of closing. I'm just saying at the time of closing because I don't have any other dates that have been given to me that obviously we know they talked before, but I don't know what that date is. So then I'm left with, at the time of closing, I know what my closing date is. And when I go back to, what did I say? 4.10 and 4.11, representations and warranties. And then that has been must have performed each of these covenants. So once all of that is done, then Lenny's will have his obligation to perform his, his subject matter performance covenants. And then Headspin shall, or Headspin, or Headspin shall perform its obligations as, as set forth in the subject matter performance provision of this agreement if each of the following conditions has been satisfied before or at the time of closing. The representations of Lenny's set forth in 4.0, 4.01, I don't and sometimes I may say 3.0 through 4.02, but I want to be more definite. I want to say specifically which articles I'm talking about. Must have been true at the time of closing. So, that's true. He has title, and the quality is decent and playable. That's all he's represented. If that's true, then Headspin must perform their subject matter performance cover. Okay? And so that's how we need to, you know, do this. Now, I'm going to talk about the signature. So after the conditions to closing, then we're going to work on our signatures. Okay. Now, um, somebody asked, I'm going to go back and get this question. What is the best way to break up the business slash action sections? I hope I uh, stated that here. If not, Please get back with me. But what I am saying is that you already know the formula. Actions first, okay? You know what you need to have in there uh, for your actions provisions. And then business, just put whatever goes, whatever, whatever is not, it's not going to go on your representation and warranties. So then it's going to go here. Name it whatever you want to name it. That's what, you know, that's what I did. are our sections. Uh, we need to have a heading for each section. Yes. Okay. 
for the signature portion, do we put the name of the company or the name of the party signing on behalf of the company? What do we put? Who's signing the agreement? I mean, okay. So remember that the names in the signature block should reflect the parties to the agreement as stated in the preamble. It must match. And I am uh, thinking that I am not making that clear uh, based on Well, we're not understanding this a signature block uh, concept. So, first of all, the uh, our what we would call like a declaration or even a covenant uh, and acknowledging exception and acceptance and agreement of the foregoing lenies, which we have which we have defined to mean. Lenny's Music Inc. and Headspin affix their signatures. The agreement is signed to signed by the parties to the agreement, and then whoever that representative is of that company, that person who is authorized to sign is going to sign the agreement. But this is the party right here. Must be stated. And it must be reflected as it is in the preamble. Has been records LLC, a California limited liability company, by signed by Jeanette Sears. Somebody asked, if the parties are companies, do you need to specify in the contract who is allowed to be a signator? Signatory? Mm, no. In the deal memo, it's going to tell us who's going to sign. Is that a question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, it's like a stylistic question, mm -hmm. um, but for the signature blocks, I just want to see if this is okay with you. I do the two side by side, like because it's easier for me to conceptualize the blocks. Like, okay. is that fine with you? Yes. Okay. It's just easier for me to okay. see it. Okay. As long as you make sure that it matches. I really don't care who you come. You know. It has to be, if the deal member is telling us who's going to sign it, this needs to be that person and that person's title. But you've got to make sure you have this. Yes. You want us to curse it, like, uh, curse the names in or like... Uh, you, don't, you don't have to. I'm just showing you how okay. I do it. Uh, the name needs to at least be here. Okay, but like if you don't want to... We don't need to put the curse in there. No. Okay. Yes, ma'am. This is going back to the conditions. Um, so every every line in the condition is going to be, is it correct to assume that it's going to be referencing a previous part of the agreement? Yes, and what I would do is I would put it w right by it, whatever it is. <coughs> okay, and so I'm going to show you that with the Ralph's deal. Okay. Okay. Whenever there's a condition, see, once I state what the obligation is, the covenant, that the person shall do whatever. And then if there's going to be some type of condition that's going to flow from that, it's not always just going to be a representation or warranty. It could be from a obligation coming from a covenant. There's going to be a, there may be a condition. And so I'm going to put, I'm not going to put it somewhere way off in the, I'm going to put it right by. So you can see if so-and-so, so you're going to have a condition that says, Ralph shall do so-and-so. Then you're going to have a condition. But if he doesn't do that, then merchandisers shall do this or that. I'm going to put that right under so that it won't be somewhere far off in the agreement. But that, you're saying that will both be in the condition section? Well, but listen, there is no condition section. A condition is a concept that can be used anywhere in the agreement. So what about number five, article five says conditions to closing? Remember, 
what I said about that. Thank you for asking that. Remember, the conditions to closing section is different than the conditions that's the building block concept. So the building block is saying that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, <coughs> and then the conditions of closing section is saying if you don't, then this and that. Well, conditions of closing are only conditions that it's like a checklist at the end just to say what is the, what are the conditions to consummate <coughs> the deal. Okay. That all of the allegations have been met that all of the representations have been met. Once that's done, then it's like almost another, the conditions of closing, it's almost like another covenant session. Once that's done, then that person shall perform its subject matter performance provisions. <coughs> totally different than actual conditions, which you will find all throughout the agreement in different places, maybe different from the concept. Thank you for asking that, that question, because that's, obviously, I'm thinking more than you had that question. I've been saying it, but it's kind of hard until you start actually doing it in, you know, doing an exercise on it so you can see how it works out. Yes? Uh, this is a, is it conditions for coding section for the because uh -huh. yeah, yeah. you're because what you're saying is that this person's subject matter performance provision, uh, this person shall perform its subject matter performance provision if these uh, after all these conditions have been met. So now, are there any other questions about that, about the signatures? So you'll see here how this is going to match now. See, Linux Music Inc., a California corporation. Linux Music Inc., a California corporation. Headspin Records, LLC, <coughs> a California limited liability company, has to match. And then whoever signing for that company, that entity. So I'm going to go back to Ralph's deal for just a second, just to see if we can pick up some concepts on the uh, representation from Ralph's Okay, so I've filled it out, I've filled, and I hope you all have too. in here. I wanted to make sure I went back because I wanted to make sure I clarified the date because remember uh, the, me the, the memo stated that uh, it was April 20th and it was like assumed that tomorrow the agreement will be signed so then that's going to be the date. Okay, so then um, we had our to incorporate Ralph trademark image shall mean any register I'm saying any register or unregistered because sometimes a person may not have registered the trademark that does not that they still own it okay I want to make sure there's no ambiguity about that with merchandisers I own it whether it's registered or not okay be a trademark or a trade dress. I will talk about that at some point. That's a technical IP term. Uh, image of Ralph, a short, frumpy, bespeckled, eight-year-old for whom life never goes quite right. 
which is owned by rats. Okay, license, license territory. I was talking earlier to somebody. I want to have, because eventually throughout, I'm going to call, I'm going to refer to license territory. I don't want to have two name definitions where it's going to be original or, you know, it's, you know. I just want to call it license territory. It shall mean Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for the first year of the license term. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for the second and third years of the license term. But only if the sales for the first year are equal to or less than $7 million. If there are more, then that will expand. added some things to the business slash actions based on, you know, if I were you, I would go back and actually go through that because some of you probably didn't, you know, go through that exercise because now that I have gone through that exercise, I can go back now and pick out because I actually, when I went through it the first time, I talked about what, okay, not only did I talk about the section, but I talked about the concept. It would be a representation or warrant. Remember when we did that? We we're supposed to pick out the concepts. So now you should be able to go back and whatever you have representation and warranty for, you should be able to plug that into your representations and warranties. And that's what you should have done. And then whatever else would have been in the business section, you should put that in there. So now it's done. Your business has action section should be, for the most part, you know, done. But remember uh, how we had this particular covenant right here, um, Ms. Cooper, where we said, this is an example of what I was talking about. Merchandisers shall have an obligation, this is an obligation, to use all commercially reasonable efforts at its disposal to manufacture, market, and sell the caps and t-shirts bearing Ralph, bearing the Ralph trademark image. Here's a condition that relates to that. I want to make sure I put it right here, close back. Unsold. If at the end of the license term, merchandise owns any unsold caps or t-shirts bearing the trademark, he shall mm -hmm. purchase them at cost. I mean. Of uh, this one, more so. Merchandisers shall submit a sample of each cap or T-shirt it intends to manufacture, being bearing should be bearing the Ralph trademark image at least thirty days prior to the first time the, to the first item. The it should say the first time the item is intended to be marketed. So you wouldn't once you once that has been approved. Let's say you want to run some more of that that's sold very well. You don't have to come back for approval again. If Ralph LP rejects a sample, then whatever the, the if then, So I was looking more up here, but I meant here. So here is our covenant obligation. Merchandises has an obligation to submit samples. If they are rejected, if that sample is rejected, then here comes an obligation on Ralph's part now. Ralph must provide merchandises a written explanation of the reason. Now, if they are rejected, then you ask yourself, is this an ongoing or a walk away? You can ask yourself that question. If it does not relate to the subject matter performance covenant, then the agreement will carry on. 